And then I got made oh. fun of for it in high school and shut it down. That was oh, oh no, stupid <laughs> high schoolers. I know these oh. bullies. Can you imagine where I'd be today? You know, the guy who had ten thousand subscribers on YouTube. I, I can't. At ten it's, years old, yeah. one of yeah. my biggest regrets was shutting down those accounts. Hey, it's Nicole. Welcome back to the Serial Entrepreneur Show. So excited to have you here and to welcome our latest guest, Jake Hurwitz. I'm so excited to tell you what he's up to because it might have something to do with one of those famous serial entrepreneurs we know all about. Jake is the founder of Thursday Labs. He is a studio that helps others create content and pays attention to their marketing too. Marketing for founders. In fact, he served as chief marketing officer at Day One, a company who had investors like none other, Gary Vee. That's Gary Van check. You know, serial entrepreneur that we all know. Yes, that one. And I'm excited for him to tell you not just his thoughts, but how he's helping to shape thought leadership throughout podcasts. Hey, if you're an entrepreneur who usually fast forwards intros just like this one, this is the podcast for you. Hey, just a reminder, our show is brought to you by Smart Cookie Media, where we believe data tells a story and not just any story, your business story. As a subscriber to the show or as a client, you'll get insights on profitable data-driven marketing strategies that work for you and your business, your industry. Not some cookie cutter trends, no. Ideas that are led by your customer data so you know they'll work for you. Connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram to learn more. Everything's in the show notes. Now, let's get back to the show. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. That was a good intro. You nailed it. You're good at this. Thank you. Thank you. Jake, we want to start off the way we do with everybody. Tell me, how would you finish the sentence? You know you're an entrepreneur when? So there are two immediate answers that came to mind. I'll show them both. You know you're an entrepreneur when you find yourself thinking about your company at moments when you should be not thinking about your company, like when you're in the shower, having sex with your partner, like all these moments where it's like, shouldn't be thinking about your company right now, but like it's on your mind. And then the other is when you're genuinely scared to open up your bank account, not necessarily because you're constantly broke, but it's just like with that last wire, like I hope that went through. And it's just the anxiety around cash flow yeah. is just always front of mind. So good. Okay. So tell us, what businesses do you own? Who are you helping? I lost count, but I think I've started like seven companies since I was 18. Most were, you know, a quick attempt, like, let's go validate this thing. Some we raised money for, some were dragged out longer than they should have. But of those, only a few actually really made it. First company was a marketing agency, started that when I was 18, made lots of mistakes. In college, then years later, we pivoted to an ed tech startup. That was, I mean, 2016. The vision was to have really high quality cinematic online courses for creatives to learn business skills. Then got into venture. I went to a startup venture studio, ran out of college, basically, as a VP of branding. We were launching four to five startups a year. One of the startups we built was the Global Startup Studio Network. It was the first and still is the most prolific, I would say, consortium of startup studios globally. At the time, there were new studios popping up kind of slowly, but sold that company shortly after to the Global Accelerator Network, and then spent years after that independently consulting and advising new studios. This is where things start to come together, but slowly over the course of a few years, but became a thought leader essentially in the space. And that was through writing white papers, producing content writing on LinkedIn, building a newsletter, like working with clients, advising studios, very niche space. No one knew what a studio was at the time. And so when new studios were popping up, they needed expert level help to understand, you know, how do we pitch this to LPs or how do we pitch this to VCs or entrepreneurs? So they bring me in to work with them. I went to raise a fund to invest in studios during COVID. I was 25 years old. Looking back, you know, what a nutcase I was to like try to raise a $25 million fund on the internet with a few business partners at 25 years old during a pandemic. We actually raised about half the fund and didn't end up closing it. But interesting process. I ended up then joining another company. They were like, can you come do this for us with much more capital and we'll go way bigger and much bigger resources. They sent me an offer I couldn't refuse. So I did that. Just kind of like my 20s were unfolding, right? And then left that company to join day one as a CMO. Mm -hmm. And that took me up until just about exactly one year ago. Market crashed and that company basically went under. And then without a beat, I started Thursday Labs. And so that's what I'm doing. The long and short with Thursday Labs is you've got all these founders out there and investors who want to be a thought leader. They feel they need to in order to help them raise more money, hire better talent, obviously close bigger deals, just make more revenues. And they look at their competitors, they look at their friends and like, they see that person has a podcast. They're like, I want a podcast. They see that person runs a newsletter on Substack or Beehive. And they're like, well, I should have a newsletter. I should be putting those video clips on LinkedIn and TikTok every day. I should be tweeting a lot to, you know, get my name out there. 
they have no idea how to do any of this. They don't know where to start. It's very daunting. They don't know what to talk about on camera. They don't know how to post this stuff, what hashtags to use. And I realized you know, you've got all these podcast agencies out there, but they just will produce the show and then you've got to be the one to distribute it. Or you've got all these growth hackers out there and be like, well, you go make me the content and I'll just go distribute it so that people see it. Or you've got all these ghostwriters out there who are like, I'll write you your newsletter, but you know, you need to like help me actually get the content. They were only pulling one slice out of the market. It wasn't enough. I was like, what if we did the full service where I with the founders and they're busy. They need to focus on building their company, but we'll produce the show. We'll do all the creative. We'll actually get them their guests. We'll do all the research ahead of time. We'll actually edit the episodes. We'll cut all those short clips. We'll run your blog. We'll run your newsletter. We'll post it all for you. All you got to do is show up for one hour a week to record the episode and then wake up every day with just like notifications in your LinkedIn or your inbox of people commenting, right. subscribing, whatever it is. And so I put that out there, like this offering flat rate, set number of months, 6K a month for four months will produce 12 episodes to start. You'll get all this content out of it posted every day on every channel. Let me know. I put that out there in an email blast to about 200 people in my network. By the end of the week, we went from one show to eight shows. Awesome. So I was like, oh, wow, there's something here. And then basically spent the last six months just like, how do we go from running one show to 10 shows at a time? And now building a real studio out of this. I want to be the first and biggest production studio for founders. I'm like, I have a Hollywood studio for actors and actresses. You've got a yeah. record label for artists and musicians. You've got agencies for athletes. Why does this not exist for entrepreneurs? I don't get it. And they're the biggest rock stars in the world now. So that's what we're building. And I moved from New York to LA two months ago to like do it. Awesome. Tell us, where do you come from? Where did you get this confidence to do what you do? Sometimes there's a childhood story someone brings up right around now that you saw something. I always say if kids can see it, they can be it. Is there yeah. something, maybe a business owner you knew early on? I grew up in New York with very divorced family and a very serious athlete. So, you know, you put together like the New York hustle and I'm not sure where the divorce really fits in, but you know, I think that does play a big role of like wanting to you know, get attention from people and like please them and having to grow up very independent, you know, being in New York, like post 08, as I was going through middle school and high school and the recession, like everyone was hit really hard. No one's parents around me, like had money to help them buy an Xbox or pay for a car or gas. Gas was like five bucks a gallon in 2010. I had to buy a car. I like needed to get out of the house after school. I needed a job, but I needed to have a job to make money to afford the car. And I did the math. I can't afford the car and I can't afford gas with all the hours I have after school and on the weekends with a minimum wage job. So I started a tutoring company. My dad, you know, tough love. He's not a veteran. He's not in the military, but like you look at him and you think like this is a military guy. Certainly raised me in that way. Just like pushed me and my siblings hard to don't just like take the job that everyone else has. Like, could you do better? Could you do more? So yeah, every day after school, five days a week, I had a whole book of business of younger students, right? Tutor oh, them students. like, yeah. Like first grade math, like I was a shitty student. I had a C average, but I could still teach a kid how to like yeah, do yeah. basic addition and subtraction. 30 bucks an hour, cash. So we're making oh a bunch of cash doing that. And wait, what was dad's job? What did he do? My dad was in media in New York City. So he worked at AOL early on, NBC. He was there at XM, Sally Radio before the merger. And then he got into tech as well. He's a CRO, chief revenue officer. So he didn't want to like force me into the same world, but you know, you couple that entrepreneurial mindset with the big piece I left out, which is like, I'm an artist. You know, I grew up painting and obsessed with social media. I mean, I had a YouTube channel when I was like 10 with, I genuinely think looking back, it was like 10,000 subscribers before Google bought YouTube. Mm -hmm. I learned yeah. how to write HTML on CMS and CSS through MySpace. Yeah. And I yeah. had this channel where I did reviews of art materials, markers, and stuff like that. Wait, MySpace, I feel like you're not old enough, but it's because you were there so young, right? I was like, was what literally was. like 10 yes. years old. <laughs> you were 10. Yeah. I don't so know I was like, why. Wait a second. Yeah, I don't know why my mother like let me do that, but right, didn't yeah. know. they didn't know. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, yeah, right. I'd spent all day, every day, just like, tinkering on like this new thing called social media. No one had the word content, but yeah, I was making long YouTube videos and tutorials and unboxings and all this stuff many years ago. Sold custom van sneakers on YouTube. And so just early on was like always doing the kid entrepreneur stuff using like new tools that were out there that were not regulated. Parents didn't know what we were doing. I'd be up for hours on end all night, like on my shitty Windows 95 computer. <laughs> Take two hours just to turn on. Yeah. And then I got made cool. fun of for it in high school and shut it down. That was oh, oh no totally stupid <laughs> high schoolers i know these oh. bullies can you imagine where i'd be today if i had you know the guy who had ten thousand subscribers on youtube i, well, I yeah, can i can at 10 it's, years old yeah, yeah exactly. 10 years yeah. old yeah. one of yeah. my biggest regrets was shutting down those accounts 
It was pretty oh, funny. Goodness. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because you support founders and entrepreneurs, I'd like to think there's a few listening right now. Tell me, what are you seeing today? What are you seeing in terms of trends or things that people aren't doing and what do they need to be doing? It's such a good question because it's such a big question. I'm just going to go there right now. Please. It's a bloodbath out there. And I don't mean it in the sense of the market's tough and interest rates are high and you know people are scared for the economy and scared for all this stuff. I just think people are exhausted. And I think that we have finished this decade plus long chapter of really toxic principles in the startup and entrepreneurial ecosystem. The best way to sum that up is like the whole world was about raising a lot of money from venture capitalists and that's how you measure success. And then what happened was pretty cleanly, we entered the era of massive IPOs that didn't really play out. Pinterest, Uber, Airbnb, DoorDash, et cetera. Like they're good IPOs, of course, don't get me wrong. I wasn't involved in them, so who am I to bash those? But I look around and my peers and I talk about this now, we've been so indoctrinated into this mindset of like, scale fast, grow at all costs, spend money you don't have, hire slow, fire fast, sell, sell, sell before you even built anything. Like all these principles, that's just all we knew are really backfiring on us now. And now you've got folks that actually weren't really part of that world. They hadn't never started a company, but they've always dreamed of starting something maybe when they became financially independent or financially free. And now they're old enough to be able to do that. 28 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, whatever. And all they know is the story that they were told through all the podcasts, the movie, the social network, the show Shark Tank, all of which were so freaking misleading. But that's pop culture because it's a damn good story, right? And now we need to kind of rewire our brains to fundamental stuff, like make a good product for some customers that pay you more than it costs you to make it. Like the amount of shit that you can build now with almost no money and almost no time that even a year ago would have taken hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in venture capital and a team of nine engineers to build. We're seeing high school kids do this with chat GPT and their friend right. on a Friday night from their parents' basement. Right. It's crazy. And they may not be building $40 million companies or products that are selling out in a week, but to be somebody with no technical ability and have some logic and the ability to talk to Chad GPT and create a business that cash flows five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month in three hours a week. Are you kidding me? Like that's a whole new paradigm shift. Yeah. I'm shocked how few people are capitalizing on this right now because they're thinking, oh, I've got this like shit job. I'm scared I'm going to lose it. I make good money. Like, I have health insurance, all this stuff. And then they think, oh, I should start a side hustle. But they're indoctrinated to think that side hustle needs to be like some e-com business that makes $100 million a year. Or like, I need to start a podcast full time that allows me to make 120K a year and go all in on that full time. It's like, Or you could just start like help people take their podcast and turn it into blogs for $500 a pop. It takes you five seconds to do it on ChatGPT. Yeah. You just made an extra yeah. three grand that month. And you can go find those people on TikTok because that's what the algorithm does. That helps you find new people. Like, right. it's all so easy. And no one's doing it. And I'm really actually eager and excited for the next few years to like see how this plays out. So let's talk about what you do. Who do you help show off? And what are some of the outcomes that you're working towards with them? Yeah, so all the time I have to play a talent scout. I get to wear that hat, which is fun. I'm out there looking for an interesting profile of person. This is a startup founder who recently raised some money, a couple million bucks probably, or they're like bootstrapping a business. So they have some money to spend. They've got some backing. I, from the outside looking in, think they've got a great solution. And I'm looking at them through the lens of what I invest in them, like VC hat. But I now put on a new hat, which is, can I make them a star? Wow. Can they be a star? Are they a character? Do they have a good voice, attractive face, whatever that needs to mean? Like, can we put them on camera and make them a star? And then I do what I got to do to network my way and basically be like, look, it is malpractice for you to not be a thought leader. Like, you have an incredible problem to solve. You are solving it. But yet there's someone down the street, your competitor, if you will, who doesn't have as good of a solution, but they're loud and they're putting their face on billboards and like they're getting all the business, but yet you've got a better solution. That is irresponsible for you to not be the face that everyone knows about. Look at this. The first guest we have throwing out legal words before Matt has. This is great. I'm just waiting for allegedly. Allegedly. Oh, allegedly. So the offer I make to them is I'm like, look, I want to produce a whole content series around you and your brand. Right now, it's your company's brand, but you might sell that company in five years or 10 years and like you got to then be on to the next thing or you might fail. Probably more likely it's going to fail. You still need to figure out something next. So I say, here's the effort. I'm going to produce you a podcast. I'm going to name the podcast. I'm going to find you all your guests. I'm going to create the intro jingle and all the thumbnails. We're going to brand it. And I'm going to go get all the biggest names and thought leaders in your industry to come on your show. 
Some of them might be your investors. Some of them might be your customers. Some of them might be your competitors. Some of them might be a very famous person that you've never met before. And a lot of them are going to be your prospects. And by the way, these are B2B brands who need to actually create good pieces of marketing collateral. No more shitty, cheesy stock images or like those awful animation videos of cartoons. Like, yes. this is Sam. Sam has a prof. That makes me nauseous. Yeah. So my vision is I want to make people fall in love with these founders and these brands just as much as they fall in love with like Patagonia, Yeti mm -hmm. Coolers, Nike, Apple, like super loyal brand followers. Then I train my clients to become great podcast hosts. We send them a box of equipment for them to keep the best cameras and lights and mics on the markets. We'll help you set it up, do all the booking, you show up. I'm going to feed you the questions that you need to ask your guests on Slack live while we're recording on Riverside. You're going to do it live. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what? We do I'm it sure all, Jake we do it right walking there. into uh, networking opportunities like this, like when he's right. like sizing people up now. A little like he's bit. not just uh, like... Yeah. I'm, I'm keeping an eye yeah. out all the time. He a, well, he said he's a talent scout. I mean, think about like professional yeah, sports. What, they're yeah. always looking. I don't care if they're watching a high school game in the middle of nowhere. If you're a professional scout, you're always mm -hmm. sizing people up. Always doing it. And it's funny because so many of my clients will bring guests in who are an amazing guest. And I'm like, that's my next. Like, that's my star. I reach into them. <laughs> yes. That's like part of our growth. But the distribution now, you don't have any followers. You've never tweeted a day in your life. You have no presence on Instagram or TikTok. That's good. Don't do it. Let me do it. Like, let go of the reins. Don't question it. Don't be concerned. Don't worry about it. We're going to now edit your episodes, cut all those short form clips. I'm going to turn every episode into a blog and a newsletter. We're going to build that blog page. We're going to build that newsletter for you. We're going to embed it into your website. We're going to make it SEO ranked. We get all this stuff set up in the first month. Like, we're moving really fast on it. So that come week five, it's like time to start posting. And now I have access to your social media accounts through a tool that we use where we can post on behalf of my clients without logging in their account. Post every day and we check in every week. What did we do last week? What did we learn? What's the projected ROI from this? Are we doing better with like educational content, humorous content, inspirational content? Are the short form videos doing great on YouTube? Shorts, are they better on LinkedIn or TikTok? It's a four month process and that's just to get started. I look at this a lot like personal training. Like you want to be a professional athlete, but you've never worked out a day in your life. It's going to take a long time, but you've got to start somewhere and you've got to trust the process. And you can't come to me after three weeks and be like, where's my six pack? And I get that right. asked a lot. Like, why haven't I gone viral yet after three weeks? Why haven't I gotten, you know, a million new followers? And I fire those clients. It's not the right fit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So what is your measure of success after four months? Because it isn't going viral. There might be some new prospects, but even if they're raising capital, the long game is the long game. I mean, they, they know that. But yet it seems like even though they know it takes a long time for these things to happen, for some reason, people's brain goes to mush occasionally when it comes to content. Oh, no, yeah. shouldn't this just go viral? Shouldn't this solve all my problems? Can you talk through that a little bit? Yeah, I have two buckets on how we measure success. One is the basic metrics. So always looking at click-through rate, engagement rate, stuff like that. With clients, they all think like, if I go viral, if I get a lot of followers, that's going to solve all the problems. Like that's all nice, but it doesn't really matter. But they don't know that. And I have to understand my sure. market. Yeah, so I make them feel course. good. We share big numbers. Like, look, if you went from zero to 150 followers in the first month, which anyone looking in like 150 followers is nothing, but that's a huge growth rate. Mm -hmm. If you went from 6,000 to 8,000, and that happens a lot in the first yeah. 60 days, like huge yeah. growth rate, that's a big flashing green. Think about if you continue even a fraction of that growth rate over the next three years, five years, like you have hundreds of thousands of followers, this stuff compounds. So then we measure what I call TTC and time to value. TTC is time to complement and time to value. And so even in the first week, we've already developed the creative strategy for your show. You've already set up your home studio and you've already invited six people to be on your podcast. A week ago, you were afraid to even get on camera. That's a huge win. That is a huge yeah. measurement of success. Like, look at how much progress you've made here. And we're going to celebrate that. We're going to throw a freaking party. And then there's time to compliment. This is where everything changes. So I look at what happens when you start working out for the first time. And after like a month, you're at a party or a dinner and someone comes up to you and it's like, hey, you've been working out. Do you lose weight? That moment changes your life. Like something goes off in your head and you're like, yeah, thank you. Yes, I did lose weight. I lost three pounds. You're never skipping a workout again after that. And so all of my clients at some point within the first 60, sometimes 75 days of putting out content, someone comes up to them or sends them a DM who kind of matters to them. It's not just like a friend and is like, hey, I've been seeing you on LinkedIn, I'm seeing that stuff on TikTok. It's looking really good. I love your new show. And most of the time, the person never actually listened to the full episodes, but they get this spark, their eyes yes. open, they get this light bulb moment. We're like, oh, my God, yeah, like, thanks. Yeah, I'm a thought leader now. I'm important. I have yeah. meaning. So we measure how long it takes to get there. 
The other bucket is the numbers, the revenue, what actually came out of this. Did a lead come in from one of our blogs or one of our episodes, you know, subscribed on the website, and then we can track, did they move to your funnel and become either a hot lead or a deal? How much revenue did that bring you? Did we have a guest on the show who was a prospect that was stuck somewhere in your pipeline or you didn't have an intro to them? But now when you provide them value, hey, you want to come talk about yourself for an hour on my show? Hey, can I give you five super Emmy award level video clips that make you look like a freaking rock star that you can share to your kids? Our clients, guests freaking love that stuff. Two part question follow up. And that would be number one, can you point to a time where you miss on the rock star? On the flip side, is there one that you could share that has been a success? You know, we certainly have some that just like can recognize as a long term game. They're going to get results soon, quickly, you know, in a week, in three weeks, in three months. But they're not going to be an overnight hit. It's just impossible. Like the right, equivalent right. of saying, I just started working out for the first time. Like, why aren't I benching 225 with a six pack already? It's like, dude, there's so much more to this. You got to sleep right. You got to eat right. You got to show up every freaking day for years. Yeah. So the ones that just don't work out, I don't think it's because they weren't the right personality. I think it's because they're too impatient. They're yeah. looking at the wrong numbers. They're measuring it the wrong way. I'll give a shout out to my beta client. The company's called Posh. Looking back, I'll call them the beta client because I was kind of like trying to dabble in this whole model and they helped me figure it out. Posh.vip. Two okay. young founders living in New York. They power ticketing for nightlife and events. And the mission is to democratize access to capital through live experiences. So if you're someone who wants to start hosting parties on the weekend or you want to start hosting a big networking event once a year, a music festival, or you're a photographer and you want to start shooting concerts or you're a promoter and you want to start making money to promote nightclubs, they've got a whole suite of tools for all those people to make it way better and make more money off of it. And it's great. Before we started working together, I would say no one really knew about like, the founders who were behind it. They're super connected in nightlife and the music industry and just the party scene. We produced a show. Really. What if we got DJs and like huge event hosts and venue owners on the show? So like founder of Elsewhere, it's like a huge nightclub in Brooklyn, he came on and talked about how he moved from like having a roving community that would pop up at different locations to then opening a venue. We had Billy McFarland on one of the episodes who started Firefest and he talked about like, you know, what's next for how he looks at live events given what happened, he became a client. So Vontae and Eli, they crush it and spent a year into producing their show. And we ended up then building a permanent studio in their office to just keep running the show every week. So that was a great case study. Love those guys with all my heart. Shout out to Eli and Avante. I have a question. I found myself over the last probably six months, I've been so inundated with content of people talking to me, trying to teach me, trying to learn something that when I take that 40 minute drive home, I'm at a point now, and I'm sure you understand this as a creative person too, where like, I've been on the phone all day. I've been in meetings. I've been in Zooms. I've been in stuff. I don't know if it's just because I'm coming out of COVID, but like from a content standpoint, I just want to hear music. I don't want to be talked at. I don't yep. want to be talked to. Is there something we're seeing in the marketplace of this? Or is this just a weird map thing that came out of COVID? And now I'm like, I just need a, a little me time or something. I don't <laughs> know what to call it. You know what yeah. I mean? I don't sound funny. I know 100%. You know the answer is yes and. I have a direct data and numbers to point to here. And it completely informed my entire strategy. Maybe one or two weeks ago, I think I kind of nailed like how to now communicate this to the world and what to do about it. You are not alone here. I'm the same way. Why would any of us listen to a 45 minute episode about two people who we've never really heard of talk about a thing that we're not that interested in? Let you in a little secret here. I don't look at all or really care about the engagement metrics for my clients' full episodes. They have the lowest engagement metrics of all of the content we put out. It's a format that is not serving their audience. Their audience doesn't have the attention span or the interest in digesting information through a 45 minute audio or even video piece of content. Maybe a small percentage of them are into that, but it's a small percentage. People want a different medium now. They want either quick summary in their inbox in the form of a newsletter. Take Morning Brew, take any email newsletter. A lot of people like that. The most people right now like short form video clips under 30 seconds on their TikTok feed, Instagram feed, LinkedIn feed. And I love it, love it when clients or whomever come to me and they're like, well, we're B2B, we can't be on TikTok. And I'm like, ah, yeah, you are because no one else is there. It is a saturated space, but you will catch their attention on TikTok with a piece of content like this, when they're laying in bed at night, doom scrolling, thinking about all their anxieties, but yet they're your prospect. And like you teach them something really cool about the industry. So if we're a steward of information for our audience, like we're the one, it's our responsibility to be creating content and giving them knowledge or resources, but you're not feeding it to them in the right format, then you're not doing your job. 
you're actually doing a bad job, in my opinion. Yeah. See, Matt, this might be why you have to just check out TikTok a little bit. So I'm glad this topic came up because I was going to ask it earlier on and then I didn't. So I don't measure our success by the views. Unless I don't see a single view, then that means the guests didn't even bother attempting to listen to their own show. And we always do takeaways at the end. So I always tease them and I'll tease you. Hey, at least listen to the takeaways. Listen if we gave you shit or not. But it'll be our take on it. And then we chop all those up. But I never (laughs) equate that to that. However, others do, right? Like anybody that's doing a show. And so we have produced a show or two for others right now. And that's what I've been trying to figure out is how do we point them to their success when the reality is engagement's not going to be high. But how do you help make sure that people understand that? Because we're not a crime show podcast. That's what I'll listen to when I'm doing the dishes. You know, after the kids are tucked into bed and I do something around the house, I'm certainly not always listening to a business show. Although Gary Vee does keep it short. Nine minute show, I'm turning that on. 12 minute, I'm turning that on. Yeah, I think it's two things. One, it comes down to just like be good at communicating this and educating folks on it. Like It is our job to educate right now. We're in a yeah. time in the market where this is not common understanding and knowledge. And so using simple yeah. language and big bright colors and simple clip art, you know, to be like, this is easy. This is simple. This is short. Make it a no brainer. And I don't say no brainer of like, it's an obvious decision. Make it something they don't need to use their brain to say yes to. You don't need to go yeah. talk to somebody about it. You don't need to go copy and paste yeah. or share a thing. Right. You don't need to read a document. You just can say yes, sign here. We'll take care of the rest yeah. of it. And like all the best products over the last ever have made it a no brainer. Just like you don't need to use your brain to like get food delivered to your doorstep now. You don't need to use your brain to get a car to come pick you up. But before Uber, before DoorDash, you did. And now we don't have brain cells anymore because <laughs> look at what we put in our bodies and look at what we consume on a daily basis. So how can we expect people you know, use their brain cells? But then the yeah. other thing too is, My strategy for, I can't say all of our shows, but I try to get all of our shows in this direction is when you're getting started with your content, like this might require reframing the entire show and who the audience is, but super niche. I'm talking 500 people, maybe 1,500 Mm -hmm. or 3,000 people in the world that really want this content because then one, you're the only person probably in a space for people that can come together over a shared desire They're very underserved when it comes to Mm -hmm. knowledge and information Mm -hmm. in that space. And they feel super seen and understood every time you put out an episode. So you might only have 20 listens on each episode or 500 listens on each episode when they come out, but those 500 will go to bat for you and buy everything you produce and subscribe to everything you put out. Then it's about quality, not quantity of subscribers, which by the way, anyone who's listening who knows anything in the advertising world, we've never been able to value CPM based off of quality of listeners. It's valued off of quantity of listeners. I have a friend who has a newsletter. It's like 500 subscribers, but he has all of basically the top VCs in the world who read it every week, billionaires. And so if he came to me and is like, hey, do you want to advertise in my newsletter? I have 500 subscribers. I'll be like, yeah, here's 10 bucks. But if he's like, hey, do you want to advertise in my newsletter? I have 500 of the best VCs in the world. They're all billionaires. I'd be like, here's $100,000 to have my logo at the top of your newsletter because I care about those people. What is one of the key lessons you've learned as an entrepreneur? Maybe it's a mantra you find yourself saying again and again. Do it for the plot. Oh. Do it for the plot. Like there will be a day where I'm on my deathbed and I don't know if I'll actually write a memoir about my life, but it keeps me going to think of the decisions I make, the hardships I go through. Like there's a lot of really hard days for lots of different reasons, but I can look in the mirror if I'm like totally just at rock bottom and be like, this is going to make a really good chapter in the book one day. <laughs> yeah. Good plot. Ray. I like that. How would you define your entrepreneurial success? Wow. That's a great question. I'm really proud of how far I've come, but very excited about how much further I have to go. I turned 29 in a few weeks and it's a weird age because I'm like, I got one year left in my 20s. And on some occasions I'm like, damn, I haven't made Forbes 30 under 30 yet, like maybe next year. And I think like, damn, actually I've also done a lot in my 20s. Where am I going to be at 40 or 50? That's how I would define it. I don't think that's the best answer to the question uh, subjectively, but that's what comes to mind. Yeah, you said that you're proud. Somebody else said about some pride today. I will say that the age 30 threw me for a big loop. I read a Malcolm Gladwell book, Outliers or something. Don't pick up that book. Don't read it. That messed me up for weeks. 30s get way better. Tell us, where can folks find you? Is there a link you wanted us to send them to? We will put in the show notes, of course, but share it with us here. LinkedIn, that's my spot. Name's Jake Hurwitz, H-U-R-W-I-T-Z. And then our company website, thursdaylabs.co, spelled how it sounds. That's where you can see the work we're doing. Awesome. Such a pleasure, Jake. This was Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Hey, it's Nicole, and that's the end of the interview. But stick around. This is the part where Matt and I break it all down and give you our favorite takeaways. Listen in.
Oh, wait, Matt, we just wrapped up with Jake. Biggest takeaway, what do you have? Biggest takeaway for me was, from a self-reflective standpoint even, the idea that how we distribute content, we're almost doing an injustice to our audience, maybe you want to call it the world or even the universe, if we're not distributing content in such a way that's digestible for that specific audience, whether that's the 45-minute podcast, whether it's the eight minutes or under ticker mark, you know what I mean, to have a smaller show, or if it's just quick little one-minute, couple-minute blurbs, he spoke very passionately about those areas, you know, as far as the responsibilities on us to make sure we're getting the content out in the digestible form that the audience is going to receive it. Yeah, I thought that was great because we have a lot of examples here on this show. We serve entrepreneurs. And even if you want to listen to music on the ride home, you're likely on the phone. Let's be real. <laughs> you're likely making a call or connecting with somebody you didn't get to or instead following up via phone that should have been an email, something like that. So they're really, really busy folks. And so our audience, big, big term audience, not just those listening right now through a podcast app, is multifaceted people. They're in a lot of different places. And so we've started playing around with testing. Like, well, if we give just five minutes of it over on Facebook, is that enough to get them to listen to the whole show? Where we had a meeting and we're like, you know what? The whole show just belongs there, right? If that's where someone's going to see it, let them have as many minutes as they want. Don't pull them out from one of the most addictive apps you know, in the world right now, Facebook. Don't pull them out to go take them somewhere else. Facebook doesn't like that anyway. And so we've done several clips. That's for sure over on TikTok and all the places. But knowing that they're different places, give them what they need when he said, you know, late at night, even if it's doom scrolling, you know, when they're trying to get their mind off of something else, be that seven seconds. And sometimes it's hard to get us down to seven seconds. So I've started even creating seven seconds and 15 seconds mm -hmm. because of that. So find them wherever they are. And what he does for these founders, these thought leaders, if you will, is he helps them probably get out of their own way is what I'm hearing because yeah. some of these guys are so brilliant at what they do. I find that even with our show, sometimes I'm like asking myself questions regarding like the content and, you know, length because there's certain guests we have on that I just eat up, keep them on the show another hour. And I feel right. like, oh my gosh, like this person's amazing. And yet I'm saying to myself, is our audience going to connect with it? Like the way you and I are on the call, right? Right, right, like, right, right. Or they might not just because they get stuck at the 43 minute mark. Right. Right. And so they're not going to turn on. So like I think of Antelike, they say yeah. that right? Yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah. I love David M. Carter. Loved every bit of his, but it probably would serve more people if we spliced it up. Also, he needs his own show too. And he talked about how his team is saying, yeah, no, how you want to do it, no. Right. When really, this is exactly what Jake just proved to us is that someone like David M. needs his own show. And it should be about the thing he wanted to be. Remember, he wanted to just interview the everyday human. Right? right? The nurse that's taking care of patients. And I thought they were great ideas, but there's somebody around him that's saying no. And instead, Jake is getting people out of their own way and sometimes getting their team out of the way and creating this content in a box, if you will. I think that's really amazing. I'm inspired. I'm inspired to figure out how we totally serve inspired. everybody I better. I didn't know where the show was going to go, to be honest with this one. I'm really inspired leaving that call because it's a lot of self-reflection leaving the call. I guess I just started realizing late at night when I'm doom scrolling, I'll look to see how long that video is. If it's beyond yeah. eight minutes, if it's beyond yeah. eight minutes, I ain't watching. I'm, I'm right. Say it, but I, you know, right. It is not happening. But so I think so. that's really important. I think we maybe have evolved as well, right? Even as podcast listeners, because what you just described, I also used to listen to more business podcasts and I have listened right. to fewer. Like I find my couple favorites and then that's it. Yeah. And there is like Diary of a CEO. If I know the CEO, then I'll go watch it. But I know it's going to be long. So I, I don't always have that in my life. We also have two little ones, right? That are right. more and more vocal every day, both you yeah. and I. So I don't always have that brain space in the evening. And plus business podcasts, I don't know about you, but they, they get me revved up. I just want to go back to work. I just want to do the thing next. And so then I have to pull back from those. So if that's our audience too, it's literally the reason why we wrote the intro the way we wrote it, right? If you want right. to fast forward through intros like this one. And right. so this is us, folks. This is you watching our strategic planning right now yeah. <laughs> in real time. You behind the curtain. This is exactly behind what we would be curtain. doing if we were analyzing somebody else's show. Just so true. That. So true. Exactly yes. That's why yes. we started the show. We would just be talking about it. First. Let's turn the mics <laughs> on. Let's do this, right? So. Right. And so we created that intro that way, but now we need to, you know, reconfigure. And maybe that means we have more than a weekly show because we're posting five times, but short 10 minute episodes. Right. Stay tuned. Let's see how this changes things. Matt, thanks so much for making it through the day today. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're under the weather. <laughs> so glad. But as we always say, folks, if you're listening, keep listening. You've been listening to the Serial Entrepreneur Show, produced by the team here at Smart Cooking Media. 